evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we will uh, begin our special uh, joint meeting, no, no pun intended, of the Fairfax Town Council and Fairfax Planning Commission to conduct a town forum on cannabis policy. And uh, joining us this evening is uh, Mr. David McPherson of HDL Companies, uh, who will give a presentation on kind of the overlay of state laws and uh, the interplay between local laws and state laws when it comes to um, cannabis regulations. And a couple of procedural points here. Uh, just want to note that we have four of our uh, town council members here, Renee Goddard, um, <coughs> excuse me, Barbara Kohler, Bruce Ackerman, and myself, Peter Lax. Uh, and just a procedural point, just want to also just take a roll call of <clears throat> any planning commissioners who are here. Uh, if you could just raise your hands. And um, so we have, um, for the record, we have uh, Mimi Newton in the back, uh, Phil Green, Laura Curlihan, um, and that's uh, Cindy Swift and Michelle Rodriguez. Uh, anyone else from the planning commission? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, sir. Uh, okay, then uh, with that, then, um, Garrett, would you mind introducing our, uh, our speaker and uh, we'll get started. Um, throughout the meeting, um, if folks have brief pr questions for points of clarification, uh, we, um, we We'll entertain a few questions. We will also be passing out cards for people to write down questions. Uh, we'll have an opportunity for a more extensive comment towards the end, but if there are any questions, we'd want to just limit them to just clarifications of um, points that, that are being brought up. Uh, so uh, with that, Gary? Sure, I think I've turned on everything properly since Michelle's not here. And then just a point of order that uh, did the council approve the agenda and affidavit of posting? Oh, good point. Uh, so I make a motion to approve the agenda and affidavit of posting. Second. So Kohler and Goddard. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, just trying to reflect it properly so I don't get in trouble tomorrow. Let's see, that we're okay, great. So with that, I think I will turn it over to David McPherson. Uh, HDL companies, they are, they have, I don't know how many hundreds of clients, and I know he's probably done hundreds of these presentations to municipalities. Uh, they are expert in the field, and with that, I think I'd like to turn it over to David. Thank you, Garrett. Um, it's a pleasure being with you guys today. It's a beautiful little town. It's perfect weather today, so that's wonderful being here. So just a little bit about us, um, so those people understand a little about what HCL is. We represent 400 cities and counties in Cal primary in California. We do not represent industry or anyone else, so I think that's an important thing to note. Um, out of our 400 clients, we work with now roughly about 125 of them related to cannabis-related issues. Um, in the last three years when we started this cannabis management program, our staff for the cannabis is made up of former regulators and um, people that have been involved with the cannabis in the states of uh, Colorado, um, Nevada and California, and in the counties. Uh, Mark Lovelace is a trimmed out uh, board of supervisor for Humboldt County, so you may know him. And then um, I was the first person in the country to actually tax and regulate the industry out of the city of Oakland uh, when I started my career there almost uh, nine years ago. Um, in that three years since we've been doing this for those 125 clients, we have done application processing in behalf of our, our, our city and county agencies of over 1,200 applications. So we have seen different parts of the state of how it's evolving, what are the business plans, what kind of strategies are you doing? You know, we've been, we have facilities that are as big as a million square feet to ones that are as small as 500 square feet, depending on the activity. In the last three years, it's been like a, a quicksand. It's just constantly moving at the state regulations and, of course, how you're adapting here at the local level. And then we'll talk about some of the legislative things that have done that. 
And a part of that um, as being regulators of this for those three states is we've actually done 11,000 compliance inspections and, inv and investigations on cannabis businesses where there's not even that many in the state right now. So you can imagine the uh, experience and knowledge base that we bring to this discussion from the regulatory side. So this is kind of a little bit of the agenda, just a checklist, things that we're going to talk about. Um, so you can see, and then if I, you know, if you had, we have questions both from the, the council and some of the people in, in the audience, um, we probably could get to them, or if you write them down. Are we going to hand those out as we go? I forgot about forgot. that. We have uh, cards yeah. and some pens if you want to write your questions down on a card, and then we can group them, and then David could add answer the questions. And then here's some more, uh, some of the things that we will cover. So we really try to look at covering everything that, um, uh, to kind of just make it a, a full completion. Oops. So, um, you know, one of the things that we've looked at um, over time, and I think it's more of a cultural things, and we'll talk about values, core value elements, but we've really seen over time paradigm shifts. In the 1930s, we saw a paradigm shift of you know, alcohol being uh, banned and, and prohibited, and all of a sudden the transition of that. Then we see in the 1950s there's concerns of health for um, smoking of tobacco and the healthy issues of that. So all of a sudden we tax that. We talk about how we're going to re regulate that and have oversight for that. In the 1980s, we get to a point where we're talking about having Indian casinos in California uh, as opportunities for cities and communities to have that. And here we are in, you know, in the, in the, um, now where um, we've transitioned into 20 years of talking about what cannabis and marijuana is as far as a product from the Compassionate Use Act to um, SB 420 to actually having Prop 64 on there. So when you look at statewide, the acceptance of it, you know, it was a little more than, than a 50 plus one easily um, in there. And in Marin County, you know, even more um, understanding and acceptance of that, of that change and transition. And for your town, you can see it's way up there. Um, that's significantly one of the highest numbers in the state as far as um, 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 acceptance of um, a yes vote for Prop 64. So I think the comfort zone with that changes because of that, um, as far as the understanding of the rules and what's out there, at least from a... a a consumption standpoint and understanding of that as a, something that's acceptable as a, a community. So as we move through this, we then look at some of the things that have changed on us and knowing the rules. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about, because in the last six months this has been an issue, um, everyone says, oh, what is, Ses uh, what is Jeff Sessions doing and what has that impact us, what is that concern to us as council members, as people that are allowing this your community, um, you guys having one of the biggest cases with the Marin case um, associated with this. It's, uh, you know, it more dear, dearly and probably most, uh, probably one of the top three or four cases uh, or situations out there. But this is kind of a more modern as far as what's happened in the last, um, let's say, year and trying to educate you is what does this mean. So in January, when Session talked about rescinding the coal memo, um, for those who don't know Cole Memo, it has to do with uh, uh, eight core things of what they look at as far as what they're, they're focusing on of taking action at the federal level or what they will stay away from um, if you uh, comply with the Cole Memo. But what really that does is it was more for the, the U.S. Attorney General of what they were going to be allowed to do out in each, in each uh, uh, state. And so a lot of both the industry and government will say, well, do we want to move forward with this? And, oh, my God, are we going to now take steps back what we've done in the last two years since Prop 64? And really, this is, means a lot, but then it means nothing. And the reason why is because the Cole Memo and the FinCEN guidelines, which is the financial side, is just that. They're guidelines. They're not law. They're not mandated. Bottom line is, yes, it's a controlled substance, but even with that, it's really about what is law. And so um, as you see in, in step three or, or item number three is that what, what the uh, session said is that the U.S. AGs for each state will be free to decide how aggressively they're going to do something. While in California, we've already, they're already following what they're doing. They're not really changing any of, their, of what they've been doing for the last three years. 
And part of that has to do with the Robacher Blumauer Amendment. And before it was the Robacher Blumauer, which I love these short names, it was called the Robacher Farr Amendment, which was last year. That's in the federal bill for budgeting. And this kind of has a factor on, on even um, current cases of the Harborside and the Alliance before your guys' case even came up, where is that as long as that is law, even though it's a one year, each year they remove, um, keep changing it, as long as that is law, they can't take any action. The U.S. Attorney Generals can't really do anything um, to that because the Ninth District Court, um, which is Northern California, had the cases associated with action being taken on Harbor Side, which was in Oakland with me, the McIntosh case um, that came out of that saying, no, you can't do that as long as that is law, and therefore there's a pause on that. But for the council members that are concerned about, okay, well, what if that goes away? We think this will keep going one year until maybe we have a new uh, person in office, and then maybe the Controlled Substance Act may change. But let's say this didn't exist and it died. What do we have? We have criminal action and civil action for you. This has already proven to not be very effective. Um, the Harbor, Harborside case is a good example. McIntosh is that they try to take criminal action on certain activities uh, more current than your guys' case with the, the Marin case, and that is that they've had jury nullification. So the local DAs and the, even the AGs have been reluctant to try to take any action unless it's clearly criminal from cartel related, which is just in the last month, the two months we've had in the Sacramento region where we've had the Chinese cartel buy a lot of homes and do things up there and they came in and raided them and uh, put a lot of people in jail. On the other side, the civil action element, this has specifically to, to, the, to the Harbor Side cases where they try to take the property of the property owner, uh, and I think that was also in your guys' situation as well with the, the case, is that they said, no, you can't do that. It violates the Eighth Amendment. You can fine them, but you can't take that property away under the Eighth Amendment. And so because they didn't successfully win that case, they've kind of shut down and not taking the aggressive action unless it's very criminal and cartel related um, at this point. The last point on this is that all the, the rollbarker bloom bar Amendment only is for medical. It is not for adult use. However, in California, we have medicinal and adult use when where it's a blend, they tend to, because it's a blend, they stay away from it. But states that may clearly, or communities that may say, well, we don't even care about medicinal anymore, we're just gonna do adult use, you could have problems because the Robock or Blumhauer only covers medicinal in nature. So that's very important to keep in mind. Um, and there would be no reason to reduce the medicinal even if you wanted to add the adult use. So um, as we talked about the laws that came down, and you guys probably been, um, had a lot of conversation on this, but in general, 2015, we had Marsowitz legislation, which is the big the breakthrough. However, the League of Cities and the Cal Chiefs uh, Association compromised in bringing stuff together, and they thought with the industry, they came to a mutual agreement of where we're going to be. Well, the industry agreed with that just shortly because really what they wanted to do is find out where the loopholes were, and they built them in Prop 64. And so some of the things that they wanted to build in there, Prop 64 provided for them in order to have both the adult use and the medicinal. However, in trying to implement that became a chaos at the state level. So what they end up doing is that the governor then says, you know what, I'm not going to have my staff doing two different things. We're going to consolidate them under SB 94. It reduced it some of the things that are associated with that. And then there was even things they left out, so they did some cleanup, and we'll talk about it, 94. First thing it is, is that it requires that you have a local contact. So if anyone tries to do it, um, try to go to the state and, and uh, want to um, get a permit, this, each individual city has to have a local contact. If you don't, it defaults to your city clerk, so I know she's not here, so uh, you may want her <laughs> that if, if it is. Uh, the notifications will go to that. Um, and then um, they unified what we talked about, the different permits. You still have local control. That's an important thing right now is that you still make the decisions of what you want, what type of activities, how fast you want to move, what you want to continue bandwidth. You can get to control all that. Limit the numbers. The zoning is the big element to this that you don't want to do because it gets sensitive to your land use and uh, how you're doing your general plan. Um, but you still have that local control under 94, and it has to do that. 
the Lara bill that just is still in it right, up right now so to do with deliveries, Lara Ricardo Laro is trying to actually take the, if you ban anything, that they want to prohibit you from being able to have deliveries come in town. So that's sitting uh, right now in uh, committee. Um, and then the law does not supersede your ability to take a law enforcement action and, and go after local zoning requirements as well. And then um, it already took off. You know, the temporary permits are going. Just as of last week, they were only supposed to be for six months. But because they're still trying to fine tune anything, it's now been extended for the whole year of 2018. Um, they've even consolidated the applications where if you had a medical and adult use, they'd have to be separate applications. Now they're allowing them to be one application to try to simplify the process uh, for the business. And uh, the, you, the thing that consistently is going to be the same is the testing labs, if you own any other business, you cannot be part of a, of a business for a testing lab. And so that was the separation of duties for quality insurance and the integrity of, of that product um, so there's no problems. And then one thing that's big, a lot of cities in the earlier stage, I'll say maybe three, four years ago, they were jumping out and doing this. Then people were trying to take action against them because they were violating CEQA. What SB 94 says that as long as that you have a regulatory ordinance in place um, before that date that you're not subject to do a CEQA just for the purposes of doing a regulatory ordinance. It doesn't mean you don't have to do a CEQA for each project or for your land use for different activities. It just means on a regulatory ordinance because you're just merely doing that just like a tax measure, it doesn't trigger a CEQA just because you do a regulatory ordinance. And then the big thing that came out of this as well is because all the delivery companies being left out um, and so they wanted a place to continue being part of the industry and so it also established a non storefront um, license, which is similar to a delivery. And we talk about the permits. Uh, you'll see what I'll go into that more detail. And then um, one thing that's unique that really impacted some of the industry, especially up in, I'll say, in, in this region a little more, is that there was a limitation on how much total you could have um, permit-wise. But it says one, it says you can limit to one type three permit for cultivation, which is 22,000 square feet of canopy. Um, but it did not limit the total number of acres you can have. In the old, under the old law, you were limited to a total of one acre statewide, but now someone can have one type three permit, but they can have 25 type two permits, and they're not restricted to that one acre amount anymore and until 2023, and so that's causing a lot of issues more in your guys' region and, and up north from the, in the triangle from, from Mendocino, Lake, Trinity, and Humboldt because there's a lot of small farmers that are going to be impacted by this. And then another unique element of this is what Prop 64 did is consistent with that is that if you have the health and safety card um, that um, you're still exempt uh, from the sales tax, um, but only if, um, I'm sorry, one slide. On um, this is that in 20, January 2019, is the co-op and collective model goes away. So that is still, and so one of the, the things that uh, the cities are having problems with is that there are still businesses out there doing business and they can't take action on them because they're still considered a co-op and collective. But in January of 2019, the Compassionate Youth Act gets re, um, repealed and, the, and SB 420 gets repealed and there is no such thing as a co-op and collective under this model anymore effective from that date. Um, and that's very important um, of being able to do enforcement for both sheriffs and, and, and uh, police departments. So policy decision. So we have a saying saying, policy design today will help shape how the industry looks like tomorrow in your community. And it doesn't matter at what degree that you do something. If you stay with a, you know, your current ban on adult use and you limit some of the things that you're allowing, you still have it because we've had some conversation about what you're doing for personal cultivation, right? The six plants or 18 plants on a parcel, all those things have to do the decisions you make as policymakers and as, as planning committee is that um, commission, that has a factor in your decision as far as how that impacts your community. Um, in Colorado, in their citizen initiative, they allowed 99 plants per person. And that's why they have a huge problem with an illegal 
cartel going there, growing, you know, using houses and growing a lot of plants and then shipping it out of state because of the high volume of plants, therefore keeping the, the numbers down uh, to 6 or 12 or 18 becomes very critical as far as in that decision process. So why should you care? So uh, a couple um, week, probably last week, when we started putting this together before we shipped it off to you, we did a quick went on weed maps and just said, give me all the deliveries in your community. And so you can see across the bridge of, um, of course, that's where Vallejo is and, and, and where they have 11 dispensaries. But you can see not only with your, your dispensary here that just got back up and running, you have a whole slew of um, deliveries being occurring here. So as long as there's a consumer demand, you're going to have an industry in here um, uh, to some degree. If you, you know, allow deliveries or not, you have, you can see it's clearly there, and also the impact on the other side of where it's coming from. And the reason I show it on the dispensary side is because to the left of you, you don't have, a, you still have a lot of uh, dry cities and county, the part of the county where it's not um, anything that, it's really on the focus if it's coming there, but again, because of the co-op and collective still exist, a lot of those deliveries are illegally that are delivering because there's no oversight to them right now at the state level and there's not an enforceable amount. The state has been go, trying to go after and put uh, stop and cease orders. They've done over a thousand of them um, of putting people on notice, but it hasn't been as effective as they would like yet. Quick question on that map. With sure. the, the little cars with the circles. Are those locations where people have accepted deliveries or these are locations of people running delivery operations? It's not really GPS to specific. It's just showing that there are multiple delivery vehicles that come into the community or the region there. If you open that map to try to get it there, kind of isolated it, but, you know, it'll spread out a little more. It's not, you can't isolate it to one specific GPS map that if you said here's where it's at, it was on this street corner. It just kind of reflects of the number of, of um, businesses that are coming into town doing deliveries. Uh, okay. Another question, so the dispensary locations, um, well, Fairfax is off of that map, so that's probably why it's not showing, but. Yeah, it's a little tiny no, one. You can see the Marin Alliance, yeah. A little, little tiny versus little Fairfax, there's actually the, the Marin Alliance sitting there. I don't see it. Oh, it's, it's really tiny. tiny. Yeah, real tiny. Okay, so um, looking in the East Bay, there's only, looks like there's very few. Well, there's actually 11 in Vallejo. Okay. So it just because it's tight, I was just trying to pull that. It was tough to pull all the way in and still uh, keep it on there. So, but there are 11 uh, uh, dispensaries in Vallejo. Okay, but there's several. Are there? There's several in Berkeley as well. But the, right, I was just trying to do within a, a 15 or 20 mile radius from you the easy access from the bridge to, okay. to the access. But Thank that you. doesn't mean that all those illegals aren't you know set somewhere that they're just moving, working at a residential at this time. They're okay. not. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, probably in over 200 presentations that we've done, both in workshops like this and in conferences, there always seems to be a theme of the issues are concern. And working with the league and the Cal Chiefs that we represent, these are the core things that come back each time. And these are actually the core values, what we think uh, typically are for policy makers. And when we talk about core values, you can see we're not talking about moral values or personal values, although I think in some degree those are tied into this indirectly, but from a policy the, the, uh, process, the core values are here. And when the regulations that are being designed really focus on these, and you at the local level uh, becomes very critical, you know, a priority of public safety to make sure that, you know, even if deliveries are being done, that they're done safely and that there's quality insurance to that. Um, and when the environmental protection of people are growing even if for the personal use, that they're not violating or impacting the environmental of, of water, contaminations, or pesticides, and things that may get all over to other types of activities or into the community, especially if you have illegal big growths that come a problem, and currently you don't, allow, you don't have cultivation in town from a commercial activity in there. And then the neighborhood land use, um, both the neighborhoods, because obviously if it was all over and you allowed, you know, 99 plants, you would have a, a serious problem, but you've limited the number uh, to a reasonable amount. And then, of course, from a, a commercial standpoint is how does it impact our other businesses? You know, if you had a strip mall 
and you had a business in there and they're sharing air conditioning with five other businesses, how does that fact, uh, impact them? Um, or if they had manufacturing in some of those as far as the type of the equipment that goes into this, how does that impact some of the other businesses or the fire or, or safety as far as where, where those are done? And the biggest obvious common one for any business is traffic congestion, right? I mean, if you don't have limited parking and you've got a lot of volume going through something, do you have proper parking associated with the size facility or the type of business that, um, that comes into place? So that becomes a key thing. And then I'll call it close to all our heart is the big concern is as well access to youth. How is the youth getting access to this? And what are we doing as a community, either making sure that doesn't occur, that people aren't buying it legally, leaving it on a, a, a bed stand, kids getting access to it, or kids that are 18 years old, seniors in high school, buying it, sharing with their friends, or getting access to it, um, or just illegally through all those illegal activities, because you know, illegal people, uh, deliveries, and businesses don't care who they sell it to as long as they sell it. So having something in place to address those core values becomes very critical. Quick question. You just said 18 buying it. It's for, 21, right? For medicinal. medicinal. No, medicinal is 18. Yeah. So if I'm an 18-year-old kid and I have a doctor's recommendation, I'm in high school, I can go buy it. Right. But sure. as you're talking about the merging of, of the medicinal recreational if, the, what happens yes. to the 18? It goes to 21, I would so think. So it's 21 for adult use, right? So you're tr that's correct. So if I'm a senior in high school, I'm not going to be buying it unless I've been a senior for four years. And then, but if it's adult for, doc for um, medicinal, they can still buy it at 18. So if I'm an 18-year-old, I'm going to get a doctor's recommendation and buy it um, and still have access to it. So there is that gap uh, between the 18 and 21. So in looking at, um, you know, how you approach anything from a community, you know, we've seen some cities and cities jump and just say, oh, let's go ahead and do this without having some outreach and education and think about all the unintended consequences. Education becomes very important. Today is part of that, right? You're trying to get educated. You have, you have people from the community here participating in this to get educated, to understand what that is, and that links also to the collaboration. So, you know, your businesses in your community, your school district um, that in there, your surrounding communities around you that are going to be impacted in these, you know, cities that you border, um, and any other one of interest of collaborating with them to say, this is what we're doing, or this is not what we're doing, um, becomes very important in that collaboration. And that also has to do with the industry, because if you're going to look at what you're going to do in, in town and what you're not going to do, it's important that you have a conversation with them to see what's critical for them to be sustainable or things that they have brought to you in attention on a one-on-one -on -one or in, in, you know, at the dais on your council meetings, um, all that becomes part of the collaboration process as a, that's important to uh, take all that input. Then once you do that, if you continue to do something other where you're currently at, then you legislate that based on your core values and input from the community to make sure there's consistency upon that so that that reflects in your regulatory ordinance so that you've got something that everyone's comfortable with or at least you've addressed all your major concerns. And then once the industry is in town, in this case you have just the one here now, is that then you make sure you have good accountability and oversight in the regulation part of it to make sure that you're, you're showing your community that you are making sure that they are legitimate and it takes away any concerns, you don't have any surprises down the road. So kind of starting now, more or less, is the state's already got going January 1st, and so evaluating things becomes part of a decision tree process. It's do we stay status quo uh, um, where we're at? Are we going to move on and continue evaluating different activities because there may be some interest from you? both from an economic standpoint or from a consumer demand standpoint. And with that said, that's where the investors are looking at opportunities to go. What cities and counties are, are allowing this to that and embracing this? And at what degree, both in the numbers and where strategically it makes sense to have something in there um, to look at that. And so they are looking for opportunities to move up and down the state as well from a business standpoint. And then once you look at all that, it's like, well, are we going to continue establishing where we're at with our status quo? Or are we going to continue examining this and exploring avenues for this um, in town for our, for our city? 
or town. So the question always comes into place, okay, well, if we do look at something, what do we look at? Right now you're in the medicinal world on a limited basis. Do we explore adult use? Because the question is, well, now it's legal. Uh, what's the difference between 18 and 21? Do we want to kind of make sure that um, we're, we're doing that? Do we have businesses in this town that are going to lose um, you know, market share to our surrounding communities because people say, well, I'm just going to get it to and from work. I'm going to go when I'm out of town or I got to go do an errand. And so I'm just going to go buy adult use and not do the medicinal because I don't want to go through the hassle of getting a doctor's recommendation anymore or getting a county card. Uh, maybe it's a limitation on products of what they're looking at. So what does that do for you from a um, looking at the tree? You know, do you limit the type of activities? Um, do you expand a little bit of the activities? What are your comfort zone? What naturally comes because your inventory of property, you know, for your commercial? Do you want to restrict it because you have limited commercial property for certain activities? Are you concerned of um, safety or fire or, or combustible type of activities? We'll make some of that in the decision tree. And then, you know, where you are from a policy standpoint on both sides of that. So these are the different activities that have occurred, and I think you've heard most of these before, but I'm going to touch upon more of the ones that are newer or have had some interest in, in discussion with staff. Um, and the first one is a micro-business. And so what is a micro-business? A micro-business is a business that can do vertically most of the uh, four of these functions, cultivation, manufacturing, delivery or retail, retail or in distribution. In order to be a micro business, you have to have three of the four different functions in there. You don't have to have all four of them, but you have to have at least three of the four in, in any one of those scenarios. Um, but the limitation you have as a, cult of, as a, as a um, micro business is in the cultivation. You're limited to 10,000 square feet of canopy space. So you hear the term um, vertically integrated and micro business. And so a micro business could be vertically integrated, but not all businesses um, that are, have multiple vertical integration are micro business. And here's an example. What if I want to be a cultivator with 25,000 square feet, right? And I want to be a manufacturer, and I want to be a retailer distributor, distribution. Well, being a micro business limits me to 10,000 square feet. So I can have all four touching points and be vertically integrated without being a micro business. So sometimes that term is used interchangeable, so it's important you know the difference between the two of those. What's the benefits of a micro business? One is that it consolidates someone to doing that's going to do all those so they can be self-sufficient so they don't have to rely on someone else for their product. And therefore, if I'm a retailer, my margins, I can be more competitive because if I'm growing my own, my own cultivation um, product and I'm doing my own manufacturing, I can provide that product to me in my retail establishment, and then the distribution lets me move it so I don't have to pay a margins or a markup just to have someone move the product to me. And so that's where you see people um, looking at micro businesses where it makes a good business sense. The difficult thing about a micro business is where it's tough to be good at one thing, now you've got to be good at four things. And so someone might be a good cultivator or grower, but they may be a terrible retailer and vice versa. And some of these other activities do that same thing. Um, so you've got more oversight and compliance associated with that. So that's a micro business. I think you, want, you still want to make a point or a comment? Yeah. In, in some ways, I'll just be honest, you're talking a little above my pay grade, but I'm, I'm trying. And I wondered if you could explain canopy. Um, I don't. Can, sure. That, sure. and also if you could step back a little and talk about vertical integration, because okay. I'm not quite sure what you're So to. Okay. Uh, and I apologize over that, that. So the first question is canopy. So canopy is, so this room, let's say this room is 500 square feet, right? But these tables is where the product, the, the, the flower is growing, the plants are, right? This would be the canopy. And let's say this is 50 feet, and that's 50 feet, so that's 100 feet of canopy, even though you're in a 500 square foot room. So for the purpose of cultivation, they're only referring to the canopy space of growing. So someone can have a 50,000 square foot facility, but if they're only limited to a type three permit that is allows only up to 22,000 square feet of canopy, that's the maximum they can be there regardless of how big their building is. 
Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so um, when we were talking about the micro business, by definition, they are limited to 10,000 square feet of canopy to be a micro business. What I, was, what I was trying to explain a little bit is that if somebody wanted to have cultivation, manufacturing, retail, and distribution, that if they want it to be bigger than 10,000 square feet, they can have separate licenses for those four functions. And because I have all four, uh, all four touching points, I'm self-reliant on my own businesses, so that's vertically integrated. I don't need anyone else to, to provide any of my product or to do any touching point in order for me to be sustainable. A micro business does the same thing, but it has to be at a smaller scale. That's what vertical integrated means. I'm self-sustainable because I have every touching point. A micro business is only one license versus a cultivator, manufacturer, retailer, and distributor are four separate licenses. And so there are businesses that want to be bigger than that and do not want the restriction of my micro business will get four permits but are more costly because you've got to pay for four permits than versus just one micro business where someone that's a smaller, that that's sufficient with them, 10,000 square feet will grow, give them enough flour for, to their product to create oil for their manufacturing and a producer for their own business. They may, they may subsidize it with some other uh, relationship with other growers, but basically they want to be sustainable because then I can be competitive of selling a product because I can keep my price down because I'm not typically, um, I think I have it on the, uh, well, I, I think we, have, we took that off, but each touching point, they mark it up. I mean, think about buying clothes every time it's bought from a, the, the, the person that's manufacturing it to the wholesaler to the retailer. They mark it up every standing point. That's going to happen. Same thing through these different touching points. And we mentioned the testing lab. A testing lab cannot have any ownership in any other activity if it's a testing lab. So the, the second thing I want to emphasize on here as well is the, the, the term non-storefront retailer, okay? Because some people get confused with that. So again, in SB 94, they created a non-storefront retailer. That means that if I have a, um, if I want to do deliveries, and, and I don't want to have a storefront, or the city does not want to have any walk-in traffic. I can be in a professional building, uh, commercial building, like where there's doctors, CPAs, and others, right? And I can be on the third floor and have a suite, and you can call me on the phone, or you can go on and down on our website and order something, and then I download it, and we just have, you know, tables, and we pull the orders and put them in our package them, and then we go downstairs and get in our cars, and then it gets delivered to the individual. That's a non-storefront retailer because there is no walk-in traffic at all. So where cities or communities don't want that, that, that retailer or that kind of limited um, retail space use, but you saw, all those retail, you saw all those deliveries in town, right? So you say, well, obviously there's a consumer demand here, do we want to consider allowing a non-storefront retailer or, you know, can our, our existing uh, dispensary retailer now meet that demand in order to do that? And the answer may be yes or no. I don't know. So that's what a non-storefront retailer does. It gives you options if you don't want walk-in traffic. Okay? So um, any questions on the activities? Because I didn't go over all of them in detail, but I'm more happy to over here. So... Um I was downloading some stuff off the Cal Cannabis portal because one of the things that's been confusing to me is the definition of distributor. And so based on what I'm seeing on theirs, I kind of understand what that is. But what I don't understand is, and to me that has to do with trans, either distributor transport between cultivators, manufacturers, and distributors, or distributors who arrange for transporting cannabis goods, arranging for testing, or conducting quality assurance review. So is a regular distributor also a deliverer? I'm not sure. Sure. That's uh, a good that question. That's a good question. No, no that's different? a good question. It comes up quite often because when you talk about distributors, someone thinks that is. So you hit part of it on the note. So the, the, the goal of a distributor 
is to move the product from one licensee to another okay. at wholesale. Okay. okay? So they do not sell to an end user. So they have three primary goals. One, move the product from one, one business to the other, but not sell it to the consumer. They collect the excise tax, because that's the central point, so not the, the cultivator doesn't pay the tax, or the manufacturer doesn't pay the tax straight, straight, straight to the state. They pay it to the distributor, who then pays the tax for everyone. The third thing that it does, the third thing that it does is it, it's responsible to make sure the product is tested before it goes to market. Okay, so that's its me, three let key me just then, Okay, so that part I got. What I don't understand is, um, is what is a delivery license? Is that just a non-storefront? Non-storefront. So non-storefront could be, if we wanted to use interchangeable terms that made sense to most of us, it would be delivery? Delivery. Okay, yes. got it. Thank yeah. you. That's why we have it. The way I have it there is here it has delivery slash non-storefront retailer. So it means one and the same, but just like in law, there's no such word as marijuana, but people tend to call it that. It's all cannabis. But in this case, people tend to use the slang delivery. It's non storefront by law. And so I'm just trying to show you the link to that because some people don't understand what that is. And that's why, I, so hopefully that was more clear to you. Okay. David, uh, since this question, this question came up already, excuse me. Okay. Um, if you could just once more explain the, the micro business aspect and how it excludes, you know, it's any of those, but excludes the testing. Yes. So again, the micro business has the four elements that could be considered as a micro business is a cultivation, manufacturing, retail, storefront or non-storefront, and distribution. A micro business cannot be a testing lab. And the other thing that a micro business is limited to is on the manufacturing, it can only be non volatile um, manufacturing. It cannot be volatile manufacturing um, in that process as well. Okay? Distributors is responsible to make sure it is tested, not actually doing the testing. So he has to take samples and have it taken to the testing lab. That's the three, the three primary priorities of a, test, of a distribution is move the product to one licensee to another, collect the excise tax, and make sure that the product is tested. When the test comes back, so he sits and they, they sit and hold it. When the test comes back showing that the product is not contaminated, then he can move it to market. If it comes back that it's contaminated, then it doesn't move forward and that whole batch basically has to be re-examined or looked at and it can be tested a second time. So there's variations of it. It's the requirement of the testing, the requirements at the state level. It could do a mold or mildew. It could be that it has residual metals inside of it. It depends on the level of the test that, that is done at it. Um, but the testing lab and the state has a requirement, a criteria for that. But it's really about the quality of the product to make sure that it meets a certain degree requirement of state law. And there's a whole checklist of things that are listed for that. No, there's a variety, again, there's like, there's like about 12 different lists of that. Yes, this flag's product could be tanned for a variety of things. It could be just pesticides that are used even for rodents. Um, again, there's a variety of things. There's a checklist things that they go through to the testing exam for that. Uh, hold on, hold on one second. Do, do people have any just clarifying questions as to what's been presented so far? Just to show hands of people who have questions so far. Okay, um, yeah, we could just take those real quickly. Okay. Um, so, the distributor, did he get the lab? Did he take it to? Um, yes, he could, he could, you know, especially strategic of where they're located, they can have a relationship that they can partner with. They just can't have any ownership in that lab at all. Um, and then the state will randomly even check that to make sure there's some integrity in there as far as who that are and maybe may alternate them if they get some concerns regarding that. But logistically, right now, that's one of the choke points is there's not enough testing labs. 
So if there's like one in the county, then someone may be, you know, strategically it makes sense to do business with them until there's more and more of the competition to provide a more alternative. And then the pricing will get more competitive. Oh, sorry, well. Mr. Mayor. Ben made a good point. If we plan to create a frequently asked questions, it would probably be good if people wrote down the questions before asking it, because these might be questions other people might want answers to. But we'd have to watch the video then to figure out what the questions are. It'd be easier if people could write them down on the cards. Yeah, if people could write down your Okay. Sure. Yes, I will. I will do that. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir. Actually, if we could have someone else uh, have a question, um, does anyone else have a question? Then we can get back to yours maybe later. Uh, go ahead. Just interrupt because we just want to have questions at this point. Comments we we'll, we can take later on, but just clarifying questions so we can get through the the presentation. Sure. So um, if you go on the the, the the state's health department, there's a requirement by law with that they have to be ISO certified not only their equipment, but they have to do as well. It's very difficult to get that. It's not a low entry point for anyone. The machines alone are $700,000 on average to do that. Um, and they have to go through the certification on there. If you go to the, again, the state's website, they have the requirements in order to be a testing lab. That is one of the reasons why we have kind of a choke point on there because everything has to be tested and there's not enough testing labs. Just to clarify, when I use it a comment about the one testing lab in the county, I use it as an example that someone's not, if they're limited, they may be forced to not have multiple options to use different people because there are limited testing labs throughout the state. Right now, I believe there's only 16 to 22 of them throughout the state. Yeah, David, I have a couple written questions. Uh, the first is, would a mobile testing truck be allowed? No, it has to be at a fixed location. Okay. It must then, be at a fixed location. What else? Other questions? And how big? Please uh, don't, don't interrupt. Let, let, go ahead, Ben. How big of a batch is necessary for testing? Um, the the minimum, the maximum you can do as a batch is 50 pounds. Oops, did I just kill it? Oh, there we go. Yeah. And uh, real quickly, would a storefront or would a non-storefront retailer be prohibited from converting to a traditional storefront retailer? That's a land use question, policy. Um, you know, whatever it is, just like you grandfather someone in to do something or allow them to expand on it, that's a policy decision when you get to a point of considering that um, that's allowed to do that or not. Wait a minute. If, if somebody had a non-storefront and they wanted to convert to a storefront, they would have to also apply to the state to get sure, a different at the state. license. And then the question would come to us if we would be okay with that. But they do have to get a different license from the state. So I got, and I, I apologize. I got focused tunnel vision on answering it from a policy standpoint to say that it is. But the question, the answer, which you said is correct, that first the local level has to allow it to to be permitted, and then if they are, they could do both because right now, for example, your storefront right now, if you allowed them to do deliveries, they can do both, but they don't need to have a second license. The permit is for a retailer. And it's only restricted to what you tell it of it. If you say it can only do retail and no deliveries, that's all it is. If you say it can be none storefront but no retail, it's still a retailer. But if you allow them to do both, then it's one permit. Okay, but let's go back because I think you might be confusing the issue. From what I understand, it's a different type of license from the state. So they would also have to get a license from the state. If their first license was for non-storefront, and they wanted to 
convert to storefront as well, wouldn't they also have to obtain a state license for that? Yes, the answer okay. is yes. Or a type 9 to a type 10A, then they would, they would okay. require to convert to In addition to, to our local requirements. License. Okay, yes. thank you. Yep, okay. Do we get, we got it on the same page of that now? We got it answered? Yeah. Okay. I actually have one that I could probably help answer too. Would a store uh, delivery business need to be in a properly zoned address? Yes. Um, it would be a co considered a commercial business and that would be among the things that if a jurisdiction wished to allow uh, different types of uses, for example, uh, delivery, um, they would need to go through the appropriate zoning. Here's your answer. Okay. Ben mentioned it has to be a commercial location properly zoned for that. You can talk to him afterwards or at the end. Okay. Um, we got off here. Oh, we were here. So um, since there's already been policy discussion on that and it's what the do's and don'ts, this is really what the, what the, the town allows you and the council has already had discussion on. They've already currently said eliminated the, these from the discussion so we won't have um, uh, much conversation on them other than what we did um, to that. The town has narrowed cannabis discussion to looking at this. We talked about these activities, expanded on the micro business. The one we didn't talk about is a cannabis temporary event. So if there's any events that are occurring on this, the city has still control if they're going to permit that or not. If you have an event that they're going to do it, um, typically that you, there's a variation of that. One, they have to have follow state law and state law has a special permit requirement for cannabis permits and they have to follow that in order to be required to do that. But even if they got one at the state, even if it's once a year event or you know, once a quarter or that, they still have to get permission from you and a permit at the local level in order to have that temporary events permit, just like any other um, event or, that may be in here. Real quick on the temporary events. Does that mean some permit different from like a special event permit specifically for this type of event? Or you just mean the regular permits we would do if someone wanted to do a, say, an event in one of our facilities? Um, it's one of the both. One is, um, you know, throughout the state, there's a lot of um, like the Emerald, Emerald Cups up here, right? They have that. In the past, they were allowed to, they were just doing that. Now they have to have a special event, not only from the state, but they also have to make sure that they're authorized to do certain activities, even if they're going to have product um, at the event itself. It has to be a, a, an approved event for that activity. And, and there, you know, there's insurance and other things that you require and public safety as far as dealing with traffic and uh, um, even having police or fire there as part of the event as well. And so there's a checklist of things that's required that they have online for spe specifically for that. So the categories of use. Oh, another question? More, more questions. And okay. Peter. If, if, if you think they're pertinent, yeah. Um, in terms of uh, regulating taxing marijuana, um, just if you could expand a little bit on the regulation. And in terms of business licenses, uh, in terms of marijuana potency, pesticide, and health, uh, testing, um, if, if testing occurs in those regards? Um, testing occurs on everything in a regulator world now, um, for the exception of this year, so let me backtrack. When we, the, when the temporary, when the emergency regs came out, what it said is for the first six months, that product that is bought before January 1st does not have to be tested. But if you sell the product that you bought before January 1st, and we had a lot of uh, uh, dispensaries that loaded up, um, so they'd have a lot of product. One, they were concerned that they may not be able to buy it afterwards because there's no one permitted. And two, that they knew that they didn't have to be tested, and so they were, didn't have to go through that. They had to have, a le there's a language that says this product has not been tested and does not meet the standard requirements of the testing, and they notify the consumer of that, that it was purchased prior to that. However, now that this last week occurred, where that was supposed to grandfather and, and die, you know, J July 1st, now they've extended it for a whole another year, so it means they're still allowed to expand that for the first year that they're in So business. is it a whole year or is it through January 1st? It's now a whole year, well, January of, of 2018 to January 2019 okay, now, so well, it's a full year. 
that makes a difference if it's a whole year then we're talking about into next calendar year but it just goes to january For all of 2018 all of 2018. Okay. great thank you mm -hmm. and david um in terms of the uh special or the cannabis temporary events do you know if there's applicable secondhand smoke laws uh, that apply to that um and that's the local jurisdiction where you know if they have that in place whatever your local ordinance has to do with tobacco and tobacco products it could be the similar with that too so if you have events where they're selling you know alcohol or food and you still restrict them as far as where you have tobacco you can put those terms and conditions on this too in fact there's there's events that limit to areas even of where people can consume at these um, areas as well for these events okay and so we went to the, the categories in here and so um, you know one of the things that I think is important um, to keep in mind is that the businesses and you've got the, the one that's here um, when we were having conversations three or four years ago about businesses and the communities having it and allowing it to come into town is that it was clearly everyone was medicinal it wasn't such a business decision it's like okay we're okay with this but as we move forward and the business models are shifting what you're finding is you have a consumer because of prop 64 and you have the millennials and the centennials now that are getting access to the adult side that what we saw happen in Colorado Washington and Oregon that the product and the consumer is moving to the adult use side so in those states it's getting as high as 60 percent um, as a consumer's adult use so what does that mean in California we're seeing this up and down the state where the businesses are saying I'm not going to survive as a business if I only have medicinal because of half their business now that we're moved this far around is going to do adult use they're going to buy it and therefore the the smaller communities that we've seen is saying I've lost half my business because people can go get adult use now and they don't come they don't come and get medicinal anymore so that's important to know that if you make a decision to move forward with other types of activities that the business model really is going to be reflective there because we just had a conversation last night in Concord where the businesses were saying is that if you're just going to limit the medicinal no one's going to come in town of course they're starting from scratch you've had a, a traditional place here that's been a little more um, been here for a while but we're seeing that in Berkeley we're seeing this in LA we're seeing um, other communities transforming over that because they one got into it partly because of the money and they don't want to lose their market share or their revenues because they're seeing that occurring to do that you're in a position right now that you don't have the other activities occurring but I strongly encourage you to think about it if you make that decision make it a base that you're comfortable with adult use not medicinal only because those business models are going to have impacts of them down the road even though it's your your decision tree now is doing that and most council members and other cities that came before you and allowed it were coming in with that standpoint but are looking at it now that like okay well now it's going to be you know mainstream and the businesses are telling me they're going to struggle and uh, that's what's happening up and down the state as far as in that model um, and so we talked about these you're already right now only in the medicinal world and you have some activities that you've already made decision on and we have kind of already talked about them so we'll move on to there addressing public concerns and so in a more detailed standpoint of it of looking at the concerns like I said in the in the quote that we said is the policy decision made today will impact of what it looks like tomorrow and so the personal use is where that becomes in there um, you have an ordinance in place of what the number of activity is and I don't know without um, yet if you restrict if you have guidelines on what is loud and not loud right do you clearly say that you can't have any um, extractions of any type of oil done you know in in the in the personal home um, do you restrict that it can't be in, in apartments that someone else is sharing a common ball with um, do you have restrictions on the on the maximum wattage that someone can use if they happen to grow it indoors because the average home carries 3,500 watts and someone's using 2,400 just to light up 18 plants indoors what does that do from a fire code concerns or a public public if someone's um, doing that as an impact to that from a public safety if um, a police officer goes a call for service on a noise call and he's standing at the door 
and he sees a two-year-old crawling on the floor with a pacifier in a wet ground in the living room, and there's pesticides and, and plants there, do you restrict it that it can't be in a common place of a kitchen, bathrooms, and places where kids commonly are? Do you have some kind of welfare or safety code, some elements built in to address those concerns associated of where the activity is? If it's outdoors, do you restrict that it has to be, you know, in a controlled environment or not, or restrict, you know, a 10-foot setback from someone's property so that they're not right on top of them uh, smelling the odors of an outdoor plant? So those are kind of the things to just think about. And, and some, sometimes I try to encourage communities that don't have to go out there and be the Gestapo about this, but have some mindful things that you're given some kind of guidance on there so that there are some some kind of control mechanisms from a liability standpoint or concerns of, of a neighborhoods that have something in place um, and, you know, just react to, to more on complaint driven than try to be, you know, proactive on enforcement on something that's not necessarily an issue yet until it becomes one. So that's the thing on the personal use. And then the last one, of course, is, you know, if people don't own the property, do you at least require that it has to be consent of the property owner? where 40 percent of the, the property is not owned by the people that are in the dwelling to begin with, and maybe the owner doesn't even know that they're doing in that, so that is just a, a few checklist things up here to keep in mind as you consider um, discussions in the future with personal use. So the other public concerns um, has to do with regulated and, you know, what the risk assessment of public safety issues um, of you know businesses that you do have and again you only have the one so it's not as big of an issue but by having good oversight to the businesses not only that I've learned of dealing with multiple businesses one you want to keep the feds out of your backyard but secondly you want to have that confidence of your community that you're taking appropriate measures of just making sure that things don't um, get too far out of there um, but as you have more discussion of, of policy discussion of maybe expanding businesses in there then talk to those core services that we talked about. How do you incorporate things that you can have oversight in those core services uh, issues to make sure that you've got coverage on, on backgrounds, um, you know, being able to look at what they're doing legally so they're not diverting product or illegal products being sold um, and the consumer quality insurance issues aren't becoming an issue. And then on things on the right here is, is you know, part of it is you're trying to discourage black market. Um, so why you want some things like we talked about, the deliveries coming into town, how do you eliminate that if that's a concern or an issue from that? Well, you know, looking at non storefront or looking at other options to address that um, so that you can mitigate that if there's a, an issue with that. More public concerns, you know, on the, on the one we talk about, get rid of the bad actors. Um, you know, again, not making sure that the youth are exposed to growth sites in residential. We talked about the two-year-old crawling on the pacifier. Or even the people are living on the nightstands, you know, are you encouraging or educating people about making sure if you're buying product that's just not being left it out to people get access to, just like we have concerns about guns, kind of the same concept about safety insurance um, and nothing happens to anybody. Um, and then, you know, how do you have stuff set up for complaints regarding illegal activities for code enforcement? And then reminding people that, you know, just like alcohol, be responsible when you're doing this. Um, if in your case you have a dispensary, are they providing a flyer or edu educating people or advising them about, you know, drinking impaired or being a, on, um, under the influence um, is still like drinking, drinking as well as being impaired. And so, you know, you, want, you don't want issues to occur with that of educating them about that. And then, you know, again, not underestimating an open outdoors is the air quality and pollutions of, of pesticides and activities that may come in there. And then, you know, calls to service because of fatal accidents in town or people overdosing responses about just, again, educating people about the public health concerns um, that they are addressing these things if they're going to have um, the products at home. But if you do do something, you know, again, uh, putting a robust process in place, we talked about having stuff at the state level. The state level is the low bar. That's the, the minimum things you have in there. You can have more things associated with that um, to making sure you have comforts in the businesses. 
We regulate in California 1,200 businesses that we go in and do inspections and compliance. We do background investigations on businesses and employees just to do due diligence because there's comfort zone. So there's a degree of things depending on what level you want to have that oversight that you just have those in place just as you will the land use. You will want the, the regulatory stuff to be in here. Um, and this is just a list of more things that a regulatory ordinance can have in there. And I think one of the biggest ones, especially in a smaller community, is a good neighbor policy. You know, when there's complaints, how do you, how do you address that? You don't want to be handling these things all day long of complaints to do that. And, uh, you know, you guys have done a good job with the one, the one uh, business you've had in town over the years. And, uh, and I think that's a good example of how a good business and a good partnership of that neighboring thing gets uh, taken care of. From the planning side, you know, consolidating this, um, you're a smaller town, so it's easier to consolidate um, when you don't have uh, multiple offices involved in the whole process. But, you know, streamlining, one of the big things that we hear from the industry is that it takes too long to get through a process. You know, we've seen some that take two or three years to get through it, and some go as fast as 120 days. Land use, depending how you approach it in the land use, zoning requirements and requirements they have to do but gets very strenuous for any business even if it's a restaurant you know that's coming into town um, there's requirements they have to do that and this is new to them so one they're now going from an extreme of being the feral cat to now having to you know being able to sit on someone's lap it just doesn't happen that easy and, they, and their patient gets a little a little different but they're, they're getting better and better as time evolves if you decide to expand the businesses in town, you know, you're very limited on what you can have. And so the important thing really is, is a quality control, right? You're not going to, you're not a community that's going to open the doors and have tons of businesses in town. You're going to be very limited. But then again, who's going to come into town and who do you want to come into town? And it's not necessarily the big box business with all the money. It's really the business that really fits your community. Um, because that's important, you know, how they brand themselves, you know, how they hire people. Um, when we talk with Colfax and Placerville um, and even Mammoth Lakes, it's really about that business that kind of blends in and be part of your community and, and you've had relationships with them that when you do an application process is that you're having a lot of things to consideration in that application process. It's not the first person in the door or the person with the biggest um, um, wallet that you look at as you take that in consideration, but a good merit process that takes all those things into consideration. So this is just kind of a hypothetical timeline here because of where we're at. You know, if you're looking at, you're still kind of educating a little bit. You're still talking to the community about things. But if you, you looked at things, you says, well, if we did something, what's on that checklist of things that we want to do for a regulatory framework? Goes back to those core service of those four activities. It goes back to some of the samples we talked about of what you would look like in a regulatory permit above and beyond where you're at. And even your current one, is it up to date to where we've done that? Most ordinances that are more than 90 days are already outdated because of all the changing parts that go associated with that. And then the big part of it, just like anything, it takes a lot of resources from your staff and from you in order to do that. Whatever process you do, make sure that you have a cost recovery plan in place to make you whole and that you have the proper resources internally or you know contracting for stuff we've got some communities they got one planner and they go they're full their plates full so they sometimes need a contract with a planner to help assist us because then that's that person's full-time job to deal with that um did i pitch that right ben i think i did right um, um in other in other departments or other activities too um becomes very critical so that's kind of the first step of looking at the things that you would look at. Then the second part is, you know, do you do the hearings? If you're going to change your land use zoning orders, obviously you got the hearing requirements to do that. You know, do you do the CEQA requirements if there are going to be any drastic changes to any existing businesses or, or land use activities? And then approving the adoptions to make sure that, you know, you can do all the protocol of, of requirements uh, that your attorney is going to make sure you do for cost recovery fees and or if you're going to ban something or even establishing a procedure so then you've got that put in documents for clarity and transparency. 
Um, at this case, we're not going to talk into the deep about the, you know, the taxing policy of it, but we are coming up to a November. I have the November on there. It's not an urgency since where you're at on this. Um, what some cities are recently doing now, because they have a transaction tax, so they got other tax, they don't want to confuse the voters with too much, is that they're doing community benefits or impact fees for the business because it's going to still take you 12 to 18 months to get anyone in the door, even if you consider doing that, and then kick it out to um, you know, elections at a, at a different date in 2020. You know, it's not that far away. It'll be a year faster than you do if you even get someone up and operating. But if you do choose to at least get something on there, you're running up into a time frame where you have to get it to the county by August 10th. So I don't know if you have a dark month or whatever, you would have to do something uh, sooner than that to, to move with it. And then tax and fees, um, you know, there's money there. The industry does see this, but it's not as much money as people think it is. You know, in a regulator world and now with the saturator world, where we saw margins of 35, 40% of this industry, in 18 months of three years, it's going to be down to 20%. And in some cases, it could be down to 10 to 15%. So it's not as, you know, as the, the, the golden goose is not as big as people think it is. And uh, uh, we're starting to realize a, a lot. And we'll talk about that at the end of why that's occurring. And then the misconception of sales and use tax. Um, people think that, oh, because it's medicinal, which is what you have now, that means it's not subject to sales tax. It's only not subject to it if they have the county card, which is listed on there, the H&S card. There are less than 1% of the people. There was, there was less than, in November of 2016, there were 6,800 statewide that had that card. Today, there's less than 3,000 statewide. And in your county, there's probably less than 150. Um, there's not a lot to do that. So I would say 9 out of 10 purchases are, are going to be paying the sales tax and it should be attributed to you um, on the current environment. And the, uh, the Department of Tax and Fees has got on their um, thing that they sent emails out to, to the retailers advising them of the, of the requirements for this, if you have not. So just a question. Um, and people have the normal medical marijuana cards. How do they get this uh, health and safety code card that gives them the tax exemption? Do they have to file additional forms or something? Yes, they have to go to the county. The county's charging roughly about $100 to get that card. Um, and then you, you, you know, they'll have, you'll be in their database for that, and you still have to do the doctor's recommendation, and you have to do that each year. So because it kind of becomes a kind of a cumbersome thing at this point, uh, most people tend not to do that. And the reason they were doing it more was a deferment of offense so they wouldn't get arrested if they had more than, than eight ounces um, um, in the, prior to that. So people typically now aren't getting the cards anymore for that purpose. And you Did, said there were probably only about 150 in, in, in your county. county, yeah. Okay. There's about 30, 3,300, I think, statewide now. And I did to uh, check with the county and if people are low income, um, they can be eligible for a waiver or a reduction of that fee through the county. So they do make allowances for low income individuals. That's good to know, yeah. And um, it's, it's a good thing that they're doing that too, to consider that, that's wonderful. So, um, you know, you hear from the, both the industry and the consumers, you're gonna tax us to death, you're gonna tax us to death. Um, and, you know, before Prop 64, Industry is like, tax me, I don't care, because they didn't have the Prop 64 taxes in place. January, January comes along, all of a sudden the state taxes them 25%. And so when the locals try to do something at you know 10%, seems to be the, high, the, the higher amounts in there, but typically they're in the five to six range. But for those that are doing it as high as 10%, all of a sudden now you've got a 30, 35% tax. When you look at Colorado, Washington, and Oregon, when they were up in those things, then what people say is that I'm just going to continue buying from the black market um, because I'm not going to pay these, these costs um, because it just jacks the price up a lot. That also now is changing of why the industry is impacted about their margins because their profitability is not there, not only saturated amount, but because of the taxes in there. And so in your case, um, looking at it on the top right are options for you. Um, you know, if you consider looking even at a local tax, is that typically for the retail side, it's going to be based on gross receipts. 
what we're seeing throughout the state in general for cultivation, it's done on a square foot tax on there, or on a per square feet. Um, and what we're seeing more happening um, on that is the rates are coming down significantly. For June and November, I drafted 25 tax measures, and they all have no higher than 6%. We're typically, and before that, you've seen some as high as 15% on the books even though those are unrealistic. And as you look at the models, it, uh, it's not sustainable. And uh, we just finished Monterey County that's got 150 businesses where our tax measures, when there was only 20 cities and counties in California, they had 10% for all categories and 15 to $25 per square foot. We are dropping everything to under 4% and cultivation is $4 a square foot. That's how much the market is saturated and to make sure that the business becomes sustainable, um, they're looking at different things. And taxes and fees is one thing that uh, is very sensitive to them, but also sustainable. You got to make sure they keep that in mind. On the bottom here, the Prop 26, that's the fee we talked about, not only the initial application fee, but if you wanted to go ongoing to have annual regulatory fees, cost for staff, for anything, planning, you know, any modifications, uh, the police department or sheriff, that's involved with it, the, the finance department is collecting the fees or taxes. Everyone's got a little touching point that to make you whole, that's where the Prop 26 fee comes into place that you can evaluate to see at what degree you want to have oversight to manage the, the industry in your town. So we've talked about the standard fee, the, you know, the fees already, kind of the thing to make yourself whole. Um, on the right, just quickly, you know, typically the, the taxes are general taxes, 50 plus one. There's been three cities that tried to do a special tax and all three of them failed. Um, because remember, it takes 66 and two thirds. It's a very difficult, but then you have to earmark it specifically for something. Now, um, one, one thing that I want to share with you, even if you're not even looking at taxes, in November, the likelihood is that there's a called the Fair Accountability Act that's coming out. And I don't know if you've had a chance to share them with that at all, Garrett. But um, if that comes out, it's not going to only affect you in consideration of this. It's going to affect you on any future tax because it's going to require a two-thirds vote, vote of, the, of the voters. And it's going to require four-fifths of the council. Both of those are trigger marks, not one or the other. It's both of those if that passes. So that could have some other impacts to your concerns regarding other activities to, to keep in mind a concern of that. However, the beauty is, is that even if you did a general tax, um, it doesn't mean that you have to announce it as a special tax because it automatically triggers that it has to meet that threshold. It has nothing to do with calling it a general special tax. If the Fairness Act tax passes, it just requires to have 60, 66 and a two-thirds vote. So if you had a 70% that supported it, you would meet that threshold and then you as council would just have to be the fourth fist trigger approving it or adoption of that um, if you consider that. So this is what we call the cumulative cannabis, the tax rate that we talked about. So we talked about the touching points, right? So if you look at the bottom and if you have a, your copy on, it's probably easier to read, where it shows 29.45%. So what we found in those other states and, and alcohol is the same way, that's the that's the, back to our vertical discussion, you can see where the vertically of all the touching points, that's the cumulative tax of 29.45%. So the very top one is when we say producer, that's the cultivator. So what we've done for this model is that we've converted a square foot tax of $10 a square foot, it's equivalent of 2.5% in the local tax on the top line. And then they mark it up as the manufacturer when they move the product. And then if you tax it at 4% on them, and then they mark it up and move it to the distributor, and you tax it at 3%, and then you get it to the retailer and you tax it at 4%, and then you've got the local sales tax, the excise tax from the state, that's those combined with the top cultivation tax of 25% in your cumulative tax, that's the cumulative of 30%. And the goal is to keep it under 30% where we've seen in the other states where it's gotten to 34, 35 to 37 percent, that's where it pushes people to black market, which means two things. The product isn't being sold in the regulator world, but also it impacts your bottom line of the taxes. And so um, where city says, oh, we're just going to tax every activity at 10 percent, we don't care. Well, 
that's a 50% tax on top of the state tax. That's where you hear where it's 45 to 75% on taxes because people are staying in silos when they do their taxes, not looking at the cumulative impact. And you can see a thousand dollars a pound product is being taxed at almost four hundred and forty dollars by the time it goes to the consumer, right? So those are the constituents in your community that end up feeling that burden as well, not only the businesses. How are you determining that it's at thirty percent that you drive people to to the black market? That is the the four states that are coming back. Those lessons learned from them. That's thirty percent. Thirty percent, and that's also the same model that alcohol uses. Alcohol stays somewhere in that range. The 30 percent uh, alcohol, the alcohol model follows that same thing, and so where it kind of gets to that extreme, that's where, that's the pain point really. Where you know I kind of call it like the Uber in the in the Airbnbs, right? So where do you go to the hotel versus use Airbnb? Where do you use Uber versus the taxi? It's that pain point of people's willingness to pay, or where it causes them to move in a different direction. That's what we've seen in our experience of what other states have doing, but we've also seen it here in California. And is that across all demographics? Yes. We've, so we've seen it in LA, we've seen it in the small towns, we've seen it in big towns, in north, so south. income disparity. It, yep, yep. So Even, you're thinking, I, I, it's just hard for me to understand how if you're waiting to 30 to get uh, folks that are then, you know, gonna go back to the black market, but you're dealing with low income people, 30 is pretty high. Yes, and, and again, remember, it's all the different touching points that the, what this is trying to do is your decision tree of the different activities of, of what rate you tax them will have unintended consequences of that. Um, it's going to be automatically is. What, what the disparity is for a low-income person is the quality and level of a product, right? I'm not going to buy... I'm going to maybe spend $50 on a product versus $400 on a product. And so you're just going to, you know, choose, do you go to Chipotle or you go to McDonald's because of your, you know, disparity of your income and even higher than that. But people will make decisions as far as where they are based on what kind of products they're capable of buying and at what degree of quality and levels that they will buy determine some of that as well. So David, under your model, if a town only had a retailer, didn't allow cultivation, manufacture, distribution, our little ad point at the end, while the d retailer might have to pay all those prices, we really wouldn't know what they were paying when we create our tax to know if we're at that 30% threshold or not. Right, and, and, and so this is more important as a whole if you're going to start looking at allowing other types of businesses in town. On the retailer, because the retailer has the golden ticket because there's not as many in the state, right? In your guys' case, even regionally, there's not that many here. So there's a little more leverage on them to, to be able to absorb a little bit of a tax, and that's the high point. So we say for retail, initial rates are 4%, not to exceed 6%. Going to a 6%, people aren't going to go to other retailers because there's no one close to you at this point. However, that's where you see all the deliveries that they could take advantage or I continue buying in the black market. So that does have its impact on there because then their margins are less unless they've got a good relationship and they're buying product fairly cheap. So even if they mark it up, they can still be competitive against those other deliveries that may be legal or illegal. Because people say, well, I can buy it there legal. I don't need to go to that because the price is competitive on that. However, if you were going to have every type of business in town and start taxing it, you have to look at, for example, a wholesaler, a, a grower, right? We have right now 3,200 growers in the state on a temporary permit. They're anticipating 10,000. So those growers have to compete with that price dropping significantly because they don't have leverage. Because if I'm a retailer and say, I can buy your product for five, 500 different businesses to do the same thing, why should I pay a premium for yours, right? So your cultivators need to be competitive, not only in the tax, but everything else that you acquire. Same with your manufacturers. There's only, there's gonna be about 8,500 manufacturers shooting to have 40 shelf space in a retail establishment on average. So think about it. 8,500 competing for 40 spots in a retail spot. Very competitive in different products. 
Um, so they're all challenged with that. Your retailer doesn't have that because they can select from wherever those are because there's, you know, there, there's not that many around them. Um, but again, they have to be concerned of losing um, their market share to delivery services that have more flexibility. It's like the hot dog stand in front of the five-star restaurant that's paying 25 grand for rent where the other person's not paying anything. They still have that same competition. That's what happens here on the retail side as well. So what we've done just quickly is just kind of use some of the various examples called my Noah's Ark, just kind of two of everything, um, just for discussion purposes. Obviously, you don't have this occurring or, in, or saying that you're going to do this, but just kind of give you a range of what, if you had different tax rates at low rates to medium to aggressive. We typically will break different categories at lower rates. As you saw on the chart, we showed you the higher range of the rates, but you know, testing labs sometimes are one to two percent, manufacturers are four percent, and cultivators are two and a half, um, uh, roughly two and one and a half to two and a half percent, just because of the volume. And distributors typically are two and a half to four percent. But for averaging it out, for just for you know, for illustration purposes, I just gave you a model to look at of what could occur uh, potentially based on some assumptions on this. Now. That doesn't mean the reflective of the assumptions on there um, on the dollar amounts, but on an average, those are probably in the range, even if you went down about a half a million on each one of those average um, gross receipts um, um, based on where you are regionally. And the, the market's slowly getting a little more saturated in there. But regionally, is still competitive. A question, if you could just go back sure. for a sec. Um, so when you say assumed two retailers with an average of two and a half million in gross receipts, is that each? Or yes, that's okay. on each. Okay. And and again, this was just more uh, illustration purpose. No, I, it wasn't I get for, that. I just wanted yeah. to know what your assumptions were based on. Yeah. So, if you only had one retailer who maybe gross receipts is half a million, and I don't know what it is, way down. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, no, I mean, the, your we, estimates are showing a big city that has a lot of. This, this is an average, um, this would be an average city of between 70 and 80,000 um, population, but it's more regionally located, right? Your retailers don't have the population consumer demand that's going to pull everyone. However, I will tell you that Katati's uh, retailer, where they're at, is one of the top 25 in the state, and they do very well, right? So it's not all about that. It's part branding and part of the strategic and what their business model are um, that could be very successful in that. And the numbers are significantly higher than that. And so looking at Katati or Cloverdale, same similar in size and regional type, you know, as far as makeup, um, has the same element. But then if you go on the other side in the SAC region where you have Colfax and Placerville, you know, they're, they're in the 500000 to a $1 million range. And so you could end up in that range as well depending on multiple, multiple things that make up that, that, uh, that branding and the business model. So, David, I'm sorry. The, these really successful, large operations you're talking about at Katati, how much are they bringing in a year in sales? Just so, we have so, so I can't tell you that, but I would say it's, again, to be, the, when I say the top 25, the top 25 are generating between 8 and $20 million a year. And I just told you, Katati is in the top 25 in the state. And they only have a 650 square foot facility, and they have about 800 patients a day come through their facility. Do you have a sense of what the sort of middle percentile is? Yeah. So, the app, yeah. so this, this 2.5 million is based on 2,000 um, 2, customers um, per month. Unique customers, not the same person coming every day. Yeah. So I'm just saying, there's there's different models that reflect. I mean, you could be you could be the Colfax Placerville range, or you could be Katati. And I'd say it's not all based on size or where that, because you can see where they're very successful and they just don't have, you know, they're not a big population of where they're at, what they pull from. So what makes it is is very interesting of how that occurs. So, question from a government perspective. How do the towns actually collect that revenue? Is it like still because they can't do banking? Is it all cash or is there a mechanism by which 
towns actually collect the funding? Yeah, so there are banking options not only for the city but for the industry folks um, on different things. We have in Sonoma, Mendocino County, there are three or four now banks and credit unions that are working with both sides. So where you had limitations before, there's a little more openness to that. Um, there's discussions that most of the industry folks have NDAs with the credit unions or banks so they can't discuss, disclose that stuff. On the government side, we could talk about if you ever get in a position of that where you have restrictions of, of things that can't be really talked in public. Um, but you do have options for you. Um, there are other options that are looking at where some of you know, on our government client, Tao says, hey, we've got 20 people, businesses in town, but we don't want this money coming to our small little town. You know, we got a, one cashier um, working things, and we're concerned of just people bringing it down. We have up and down the state now where there's, there's um, industry armored cars that will pick up the money and take the money straight to your bank and or to, in, our, in your case, would be the San Francisco Reserve uh, that does that for the government side. Um, so there are options out there to consider for both sides of that. Again, this is just a kind of a showing a general thing. It's going to, if we try to specialize it to uniqueness of assumptions, we don't know the assumptions of, because again, council has taken policy direction not to do certain things. and. You know, again, is it adult use medicinal, and then in the variations of what that would do, um, could change a lot of the models. We're just using it. This. Yeah, you could. Uh, well, yeah, again, I, I think you these are just, these just, are just just for illustrative discussions. Yeah, at a higher level uh, scenario, again, um, it could vary on that. So if maybe we could finish the presentation sure. and then entertain some questions. We're yeah. almost done. Yes, we are. I just want to make sure you get everything, uh, yes. your remarks. So with that said, back to why the cumulative chart becomes very critical and what's kind of happening out there as we talk about black market. Um, the consumer demand amount statewide is 2.5 million pounds. But from a legal market, what's being consumed is 1.6. So the delta, even from what the consumer is and what is being sold, you can see there's a gap there that needs to be closed through regulations and enforcement of the black market. And being in a world where people will go to the black market um, needs to shove that, I mean, shorten that up so everyone, all that 2.5 million pounds is being bought in a regular market. The problem that we have is twofold right now, why the price is dropping. Just in the temporary permits as of April, there are 3,200 cultivators in California that are, are going to produce 5.5 to 6.9 million pounds. That's three times to four times more than the consumer demand in California. So you go, well, then why is the problem? That is why we talk about that price I showed you, the cultivation at $1,000 a pound, in 2016, when we did ballot measures, the price per pound for indoor cultivation, which I'm referring to, was $2,000 a pound. Today's market it averages about $1,540 a pound. And in 18 months, with this starting to occur in a regular market, that's why we show that $1,000 a pound, because they're assuming that we're going to get fully regulated in 18 months. That's what it'll be at $1,000 a pound. And within three years, that could be $800 a pound. Outdoor grow is dropping dramatically to from where it used to be eight, $900 a pound, has dropped to 400 to $500 a pound. And, um, excuse me, mixed light, which would be greenhouse related. Outdoor grow is selling as low as $50 a pound, but averaging as to two to $300 a pound. Um, so that is why the taxes need to be appropriately at different tiers. And what we show that, that $10 a pound or $10 a square foot or two and a half, that was for indoor, proportionally for mid, mid door or mid in, in, in outdoor, the, the rates are even significant. It's like one to two dollars a pound or three to four dollars a pound for the mixed light. But the key to it over here is that we have way too much product. And so that's why the price is going to be, everyone's going to be with a lot of pans and, and shovels, but no gold. And so you have to be realistic about those figures I showed you on the front end about sustainability because 
we saw this happen in other states, 40 to 70% of the businesses are going to fail within three years. And what causes that? It's not necessarily um, you know, where you're at. It's in a community like yours, you don't just, you know, you've seen small towns like yours say, we want everyone that we can get here. You know, they have 50 businesses in there and all of a sudden they're gonna fall harder. But when you have, you know, two of each or one of each where you've got a, you know, half a dozen or no more than a dozen for, you know, your type of your community, you're not going to feel that pain or failure rate because it's going to be more sustainable based on business models and making sure that they can be successful. Uh, and that's why those tax rates and everything else you do if you have a, an industry in town needs to be very mindfully thought out from that perspective. So here's the breakdown, as you can see, you're, you still kind of cover, you know, you get thrown into there as part of the, uh, the triangle up to the middle range where you have all that, but those are a lot of the smaller ones. What you're seeing happening in the south where most of that product was going in the, in the past is that all these big operators are building million dollar square foot places out in Desert Hot Spring and Coachella, LA, and so they're gonna be vertically integrated and they're not gonna need all that product. So those are the businesses up there that are going to be hurt by that because they're relying on moving that product to a degree to everyone they have been in the past and they're not going to be able to do that and so they're going to have to drop their price significantly and even to compete with those that need product that aren't doing producing their own product. The other problem that we had, which I pointed to here, is the 13.5 million pounds. That's what's being produced in California, but the difference between the 2.5 and the 13 that's all going out of state to illegal markets. There's more money to be made in New York at $4,500 a pound than it is to sell it at 1,000 pound, down a pound in a regulated world. That's where the illegal product is going, is, is all the prohibition states, Texas and New York and Kansas and Oklahoma. So that's important to know as far as what the market is doing and how its dynamics is, is changing to do that. Not to scare that there's an opportunity, because I think regionally for everyone, there is opportunity at a smaller scale to be mindful of that, but not next be the next, next uh, you know, the golden hub. So where you are at now is where you can you continue to ban on at least the, um, the um, adult use side of it, and then other considerations on the medical side. You know, consider some of the discussions we had regarding just your personal use and things that have both on a land use and or you know, restrictions or putting some mindful things in an ordinance that would be for the personal use. Or option two, looking at, uh, you know, looking at a discretionary permit consideration for expanding categories, but also for the adult use based on um, where it's going. Um, and establish some processes with limited uses is to be mindful of some of the things that we just talked about. So with that said, the decision is yours as you move forward and um, consideration of things. And I let you turn this back over to, to Garrett and uh, go from there, or the mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have about 15 more minutes for questions. And uh, maybe, uh, Ben, you could uh, ask some of the questions that people have written down. Yes, and if, if I'll, I'll go out in the audience in a minute. I just have two. Uh, the first is actually a, a question to Garrett and myself as does Fairfax's anti-franchise ordinance apply to businesses in the areas where state law would allow adult use businesses in Fairfax and we discussed that and yes if there was a, a franchise type retailer for example um, it is likely that uh, Fairfax's anti-franchise ordinance would be applicable to that um, another question and this is more directed to David would uh, has there been any impact on home values where there's been dispensaries uh, in close proximity to residential neighborhoods? So in, um, especially in Colorado, there's actually data from the Colorado experience is that the home prices have gone up around them because uh, two things. One is around retailers, they are more conscious about security. They're making sure there's not Lootering going on, um, they're having to go through stricter requirements as far as what's around them to do that. They don't have the same issues or concerns as you would for a bar or other establishments that tend to pull certain things of that. Um, and we talked about the good neighbor policy things is where, where the cities that require or mandate that. And the ordinances that we draft, they're required to, to give their contact phone number and have a liaison 
anyone within 300 feet for them. So if there was complaints, instead of going to the city and complaining about it, they have a contact and they have to address and mitigate that. And so they go above and beyond their way to make sure that they're addressing that. So that's kind of improved neighborhoods that where there's mixed use, but typically it's in you know industrial or, or retail establishment or mixed use. Uh, but there are places where you know small towns where it doesn't. There's there's no way you would have zero businesses in town because there is just no buffers for some of that. And so that's where that becomes very important. But it's it's been it's been overall not a negative unless it already initiated a negative for the community based on just the, the communities already. Well, one which is uh, in relating to buffers, um, it's my understanding that the trait, even though those are regulations um, at the state level right now, jurisdictions can adjust those uh, and adopt their own version of the buffer regulations as they deem appropriate. That's correct. So what Ben's referring to is the state law says it must be 600 feet from the sensitive use buffers, and there's three. There's K-12 schools, daycares, and youth facilities. However, it also says that or as determined by the licensure, which is the state, or the local jurisdiction. For example, in the city of Pacifica, their planning commissioner, which surprised me until he told me the explanation, reduced a retail establishment to be within 200 feet from a daycare. And I was like, well, why would you do that daycare? And their logic was is that these are two-year-olds running around with pacifiers. Someone's holding their hand all day. They have no concept of what it is, and they're not exposed to it. But for a K through 12 school that they're more sensitive about, that they were very sensitive, that they wanted even a farther buffer from it. So some of the thinking process from a policy standpoint at a local level gives you the feel flexibility to, to have to move that up and down other than the state requirement of the 600 foot buffer. Um, I'll just, uh, can I ask a quick one, Peter, while sure. they're collecting? So you've worked with multiple jurisdictions of our size, 7,500? Yes. And so if you were to look sort of on a average, just off the top of your head, what what would you say is the average number of those who obviously haven't completely prohibited um, number of retail establishments or commercial cultivation? What do you see generally in the towns of 7,500 who are entertaining this um, this type of policy? So we look at models and our recommendations for the first thing you look at is your population. Um, typically, what you're going to say is, okay, our population is 7,500, and you can, if even at the higher average, you're saying about 13% of your, your population are consumers, right? So if we go back to that thing about 2,000, uh, about 2,000 unique consumers of that per permittee or, app or, or business, that would be, if you did the math on it, you may say, well, that's 1.5. But then you look at, if you're looking at it from a business model, okay, what about the cities around you within 15 miles? Typically, a consumer of, that will go to a dispensary will drive no more than 30 minutes. So if you've got surrounding communities that have prohibitions on there, you kind of expand that base to not count your 7,500, but maybe you say, okay, our population really for our retailers is 40,000 or 25,000. And so then that would look, you know, maybe say we can absorb sustainable of two retailers for that model. So it's just a matter of how you want to look at it when making that determination. Another question um, is what, uh, are, what enforcement is occurring with respect to home cultivation uh, in other communities? And this would uh, be in regards to plant, number of plants, location, both in and out of the home, and with respect to apartments and condominiums. So um, typically what we're seeing, because condominiums and apartments are really, that's why on the thing is what cities are looking at is as long as you have the owner's consent, because most owners do not allow, will not allow it for apartments or condos if they own it, um, to allow that. Now, a lot of the cities, big or small, have restrictions on tobacco for those types of multifamily housing, and therefore they just say that we're 
we're piggybacking on that requirement that we're just adding this as one of those uses as well as tobacco. Thank you. Um, a question about potency levels and the increase uh, and have, are you aware of any regulatory approaches towards potency levels um, with respect to retail outlets? And also, um, is, is there any understanding about whether black market um, drives potency levels? So the first part of the question is THC. And we were actually, uh, for Berkeley, part of the direction we were given before they dropped their rates was, should we tax it on THC content? You know, have a higher rate like you do for hard alcohol, wine, beer, right? The higher the tax, the higher the thing. Well, there's a study for um, Washington that actually did this on potency and found out that, unfortunately, that, you know, 80% of the product all has high potency. So we would be, everyone would be, there's no disadvantage or incentivizing someone to do that or not do that. Um, so that sticks, you know, makes it difficult to do that. Um, the THC content is higher nowadays because of the quality of their product. This is in our Jerry Garcia days where, you know, people just grew it and it had a low potency. It's getting very, very high in the, in the content um, where the average is going somewhere between 18 and 25 percent THC content for a flower. But you can see as high as 80 percent in, in an edible or an oil-based activity. Um, and that just has to do with, you know, science and things of nature on that. So um, cities haven't gone to that extreme. I think that's more of a, I think the broader Prop 64, and I know this question came up, is where's our funding going on those taxes? It's supposed to go to look at studies both for health and social behaviors as part of it, both to UC Davis um, and UC um, San Diego, um, to look at studies to evaluate some of how those impacts have been occurring as we move into a world where we're having the more common usage of types of activities. And I think the story is still out, at least in California, even though the states in front of us have come and have done studies. And the um, uh, Colorado Department of Health, does an, they're mandated to do an, a study analysis every year. So if you actually go on their website, they have a very robust thing where they've looked at the different age groups. They look at the impacts of, of traffic collisions. They look at the different products from both the manufacturers, different types of edibles, different types of flowers, and the impacts of how those are. And it's a pretty good study if you have an opportunity to Where do you to find that study? What's Department study? of Health uh, Services for uh, uh, Colorado. It's a mandated annual study that they have to do. Um, Yes, and this also deals with the state laws. What portion of state or local taxes would go to youth education and prevention? So the, there are five buckets that go into the state excise tax. The first part is to tie the administrative costs over the 4% to the, the three major agencies that oversee the program. The next bus, uh, bucket actually goes into the governor's office to look at economic development in, biz, in cities and regions that have an impact on this as a result of a saturation of it being in their, in their communities. And, and also to look at the impacts of those communities of how that money is spent. And there's discretion from the governor's office to, to, to how that money is spent. The third bucket then goes to the, to the training for the, the two agents, uh, universities I mentioned, but it also goes to the CHP to look at um, drug driving and studies associated with that and training, training other officers um, for that. The fourth bucket then goes into the local agency, which has to do with grants, where the local agencies will get a percentage of it based on a population base. However, there's a caveat to how that money is even given to them. It says in Prop 64 that you get this grant money unless you prohibit outdoor grow, because obviously you have to allow indoor grow for personal use, and if you prohibit retail, those are the two elements in there. So when the time comes, you're currently eligible because you allow retail and you allow outdoor grow to be um, to get grant money. But because of your population, who knows what that dollar amount's going to be in the bucket when they actually provide it to you? What's that local grant money earmarked for? What is it? Uh, public safety and 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 and, wel and, 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 and welfare. So you know, pretty much fire, police and any social programs that you may have related to 
the impacts associated with any any impact. It could be even to, to address to you know, eradicate um, um, personal use issues, right? Um, it hasn't really been specifically defined. It's kind of a catch for all those safety issues and concerns that you've had to deal as a result of allowing it in your community because now you you're stuck to dealing with that. So it hasn't been that defined other than what you how to be eligible for it at this time. So the Department of Corrections will make that determination when there's actually money in the bucket. So you mentioned the eligibility for those local grants is if you allow retail and outdoor grows. For personal use. Oh, for yeah. personal Cause use. Because you only have to legally allow indoor. So as long as you don't prohibit those two okay. things, those are the triggering points. And you said Department of Corrections makes the yes. final decisions? Right. So all the money is going to be put in a bucket. The Department of Corrections, the overseer of the Department of Corrections, will be the one determining that if you qualify, and then making sure the methodology that they determine how you get dispersed the money will be done through that fund. That's interesting. Corrections would be doing yeah. that. Huh. So okay. it was in prop Just, six, it's in Prop 64. That's how it's worded. Okay. Thanks. So retail, with what we have now with our medicinal, with our dispensary ordinance, that that is considered it just retail? says retail or it didn't say adult use or medical it just says adult use I mean a uh, retail because that's the you know right now that's the landing point where no one you know very limited cities there's 400 cities and counties in California and less than um, I think there's only like 36 that are up and running and about 125 they're allowing any cannabis related but only about 35 of them they're actually allowing retail so they're trying to incentivize or not discourage people to allow in the retail because if the consumer can't get a product, it doesn't matter if you've got all these girls and manufacturers and no one can get the product, you know, as a consumer. Well, it's any, it's, it's any of the activities. Yeah. So the question is, as I mentioned, a 600-foot buffer for the retail. She indicated retail, but it really is a 600-foot buffer for any um, regulated business for daycare, a K-12 school, daycare, and youth facility or youth center. I'm going to have to defer the alcohol thing to your planner because they probably deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not my my expertise knowledge of it. But regarding, yeah, sure. But regarding the buffer, you are correct. As the local agency can redo us, what they do is they used it as a guideline, but they recognize that every makeup of a town, you know, their land use is different and unique. That they want, as long as the locals are okay with it they can determine what that limitation is. However, it does say that the state can still, at their discretion, you know, if you, you do it, that it becomes too critical or you have a saturation issue, that they could then override that, but it would have to be at an extreme. Yeah, just a, a clarification that uh, with alcohol, the regulations uh, at a state level refer to over-concentration. Um, locally, typically if you have an alcohol uh, a business that sells off alcohol for off-premise consumption, it has to go through a discretionary process. A use permit is, is a typical requirement. Um, there is no buffer per se. However, if it's close within a certain distance to a school, they would have to get police review and, and sign off on that. So there's no buffer per se though.
So maybe I don't understand. When you say the secondary market, you're referring to? Right, OK. Um, well, uh, right off the bat, the, the question yeah, I kind of know where it's at. So there are some moving parts here. First of all, um, I think one of the things that are going to be unique in a year from now is that right now the black market or the secondary market. Um, right now has the luxury of hiding behind a co-op and collective model. Most of the DEAs are not going after them because they can't get a conviction. January of 2019, co-ops and collectives go away. That is no longer defensible for a black market person to hide behind, and they can be arrested for selling that because they can't argue that this is for my co-op and collective. So that will be a key change that's going to transform even law enforcement taking activity because now they will not only bark, they can bite because right now they said, I'm not even bothering because it's a waste of my time. That'll be key. The second part we talked about that cumulative tax is that we have to look at is how do we make a price to be competitive in a regulator world to encourage people to come over and buy it in a regulator world versus black market. And there are some of those paradigm shifts occurring. First of all, Black market does not tend to sell manufactured products. They sell only flour, for the most part. Secondly, millennials and centennials, as generations go on, are more comfortable of buying a legal market product because it's quality insurance, which they're very sensitive about. But secondly, that's all they're going to be knowing versus those of us that have grown up in prior years of a black world where I still have friends and growing it myself or I have other options. And that will transform. All those will help transform in that. But the reality is, is do we think the black market's going to go away 100%? Absolutely not. It's going to exist there for some time um, until there's more, more opportunities in law enforcement. And part of what the governor did with taking some of the excise tax, since the, the black market is so prevalent right now, he's earmarked millions of dollars to give it to the D the DEA and the local law enforcement to be able to have resources to go after them and aggressively attack them um, as part of the funding in order to support the industry. So I think all those will come into play in some time, um, but time will tell. That's what it is. Uh, to wrap up. Um the town again so because I'm sure people want to attend meetings where these regulations are being hashed out yeah correct well currently the discussions are at the town council level we've gotten some good feedback at prior hearings um, on this topic obviously this was very informative and will further guide that discussion after the council has established broad parameters for the areas that the Planning Commission can look at uh, the Planning Commission, the majority of whom are in attendance tonight, uh, will review that and make recommendations for those regulations if indeed that is the recommendation that comes out or the direction from your council. Um, they'll make recommendations to go back to your council. Currently we're operating under a moratorium that's set to expire October 31st of this year. It can be extended for an additional year, so October 31st of 2019, and the hope is that we would uh, make a decision on permanent regulations prior to one of those uh, decision, one of those deadlines. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, a special thanks for David McPherson with. Uh